Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the sinking of USS Indianapolis, an American heavy cruiser that was torpedoed by the Japanese and sank in 1945, then leaving the survivors to fight for their lives against hungry sharks. Stay tuned for the rest of this harrowing tale, from her building to her sinking. Quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, wartime violence, and graphic descriptions of suicide, maiming, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised for those under the age of 13. Please keep in mind that I'm not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I've done my research. Okay everyone, let's get into it. As for USS Indianapolis's construction, she was the second of two ships in the Portland class of heavy cruisers and the third class of what were called treaty cruisers. This means they were ships made for the Navy after the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922. She was ordered for the United States Navy on February 13, 1929, originally being ordered as a light cruiser with thin armor. She'd be reclassified as a heavy cruiser because of her 8-inch guns and designated CA-35 on July 1, 1931, and her designation was in accordance with the London Naval Treaty. For anyone who is unfamiliar with the London Naval Treaty, it was an agreement between the UK, Japan, France, Italy, and the United States that expanded upon the tonnage limits in the Washington Naval Treaty from 1922, as well as regulating submarine warfare, limiting naval shipbuilding, and further regulations were placed on destroyers and cruisers. Though war can be savage, it does have rules and regulations. So, the Portland-class cruisers, which were USS Portland and USS Indianapolis, were built to have a standard displacement of 10,258 long tons and a full load displacement of 12,755 long tons. When USS Indianapolis was completed, she was nowhere near this weight, only reaching 9,950 long tons for her standard displacement. She was 610 feet and 3 inches long overall, had a beam of 66 feet and 1 inch wide, and a maximum draft of 24 feet, with a mean draft of 17 feet and 4 inches. By mean, I'm referring to the mathematical term mean, which is an average found by adding all of the variables together and dividing by how many variables there are. She had two raked funnels, a small tower and pole mast toward the aft section of the ship, and a tripod foremast. Later in 1943, they'd add light tripods forward of the second funnel on both of the ships. They'd also add a prominent naval director aft, and a director is a mechanical or electronic computer that continuously calculates trigonometric firing solutions for use against a moving target and transmits targeting data to direct the weapon firing crew. However, she was a mean, lean war machine, and we're going to get into her propulsion and armament next. Just know that I'm no expert when it comes to military history, so if you're a part of the military and can add to this conversation in the comments, please do. As for propulsion, USS Indianapolis was equipped with four propeller shafts, and to power this, she had eight white Forster boilers and four Parsons GT geared turbines. Combined, this system generated roughly 107,000 horsepower and was able to give the ship a designed speed of 32.7 knots. As for her range with her guns, at 15 knots she was designed to reach a range of 10,000 nautical miles. The speed matters here because you have to be able to aim effectively and speed can change trajectory quickly. Her biggest problem? She had a tendency to roll severely until they added a pair of bilge keels, which look like fins and are passive stability systems meant to increase hydrodynamic resistance to rolling, making ships more stable. Now we are going to get into firepower and military equipment. USS Indianapolis was a well-equipped war machine, starting with her 8-inch Mark 9 guns and three triple mounts, with one aft and a super-firing pair toward the bow. A super-firing armament is a naval military building technique in which two turrets are located in a line, one behind the other, with the second turret located above, or super, the one in front so that the second turret can fire over the first. 
As for anti-aircraft defense, which became incredibly important during World War II, especially in the Pacific theater against Japanese kamikaze attacks, were eight 5-inch guns as well as two QF 3-pounder Hotchkiss guns, which are 47mm guns introduced in 1886 to defend against small, fast vessels like torpedo boats or planes in this case. Later in 1945, she'd received six quad mounts with 24 40mm Bofors guns in these arrangements. Both Indianapolis and Portland were upgraded at this time with 19 20 millimeter or Lurkin cannons. And despite what some sources report, USS Indianapolis did not have torpedo tubes to launch torpedoes. If this seems like a lot, you're about to be surprised. The Portland class cruisers were equipped with so much more. Something else these ships originally were equipped with were one-inch armor for the deck and side protection. However, during the construction of these ships, they were also provided with belt armor that was 3.25 inches thick in general and 5 inches thick around the magazines. Belt armor is a layer of heavy metal armor plated onto or within the outer hulls of warships. There was also armor on the bulkheads, and it ranged from 2 inches thick to 5.75 inches thick. The deck armor, instead of being merely 1 inch thick, was up to 2.5 inches, and there was armor on the gun houses that was 2.5 inches thick, armor on the barbettes that was 1.5 inches thick, and the conning tower that was 1.25 inches thick. Armor like this is important to protect from enemy warships, planes, and submarines. Being they were outfitted to be fleet flagships, the Portland-class cruisers had ample space for a flag officer and needed staff. If you're unaware, a fleet flagship is the warship designation as the fleet's most prestigious vessel, and typically this is where strategy changes are made from and is the lead ship in a fleet. Not only were they impressive flagships, but they were also able to launch small aircraft with two aircraft catapults amidships, with the possibility of carrying a maximum of four float planes. The starboard catapult would be removed in 1945. Though crew varied, her standard complement was 807, her wartime complement was 952, and that was increased as a flagship to 1,229 men. Her contract was awarded to her builder, the New York Shipbuilding Corporation in Camden, New Jersey, on August 15, 1929. The contract price for the ship was $10,903,200 in 1930, which in 2023 would be a whopping $198,061,524.65. That is insane to think about, and an enormous investment. Her keel was first laid down on March 31, 1930, and she'd be launched over a year later on November 7, 1931, being commissioned one year and eight days later on November 15, 1932. Between that time, she took her shakedown cruise through the Atlantic Ocean and Guantanamo Bay during February of 1932, captained by John M. Smeely. She was the second ship named after the city of Indianapolis, with the first being a cargo ship from 1918. USS Indianapolis was sponsored by Lucy M. Taggart, the daughter of former mayor of Indianapolis, Indiana, Thomas Taggart. The town has the nickname of Indy, and this beloved ship would share that nickname. Her hull symbol, as we covered earlier, was CA-35, and her code letters were NABD. Between her building and World War II, she still served in the military. Military vessels in the United States still have plenty of civilian duties to perform during peacetime, and she would partake in these types of activities. After her shakedown cruise, she traveled through the Panama Canal for training off the Chilean coast. Shortly after this, she returned to the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard for a refit. Then it was off to Maine to embark President Franklin D. Roosevelt at Campobello Island, New Brunswick, on July 1, 1933. She took Roosevelt and six of his cabinet members to Annapolis, Maryland, arriving there on July 3, 1933. On Independence Day, July 4, 1933, she left Annapolis and headed back to Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Later, on September 6, 1933, she would embark yet another important political figure. United States Secretary of the Navy Claude A. Swanson came aboard USS Indianapolis in order to inspect her for the Navy in the Pacific. During this time, Indianapolis went through the Canal Zone, Hawaii, and installations both in San Pedro, Los Angeles, California, and San Diego, California. Swanson would disembark on October 27, 1933, and after this, on November 1st, she got the honor of becoming flagship of Scouting Fleet 1. 
After this, she left with the rest of the force from Long Beach, California, departing on April 9, 1934. After this, she arrived in New York City, New York, and there she once more embarked President Roosevelt for a naval review. A naval review or fleet review is an event where a gathering of ships from a particular navy, in this case the United States Navy, is paraded and reviewed by an incumbent head of state and other official civilian and military dignitaries. A famous naval review in the ship community are the naval reviews at Spithead, specifically the review of 1897, which was one of the greatest naval spectacles in naval history. It was one of the largest displays of sea power the world had seen to date. It's also the naval review that inspired the Germans to start building their own beautiful ocean liners after Kaiser Wilhelm II saw the RMS Teutonic. So, Roosevelt was present for the Naval Review in New York in 1934 and was transported by Indianapolis. She'd returned back to Long Beach, California on November 9, 1934 to continue training with Scouting Fleet 1. She'd remain the flagship of this force up until 1941, but we aren't there quite yet. Two years later, on November 18, 1936, President Roosevelt was on USS Indianapolis for a third time. He was embarked in Charleston, South Carolina, and would conduct a goodwill cruise to South America on USS Indianapolis, visiting Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, as well as Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Montevideo, Uruguay, for state visits. After these visits, Roosevelt and Indianapolis returned back to Charleston, disembarking the president and his party on December 15, 1936. From this point up until the United States entered World War II, her career was rather uneventful, so we're going to skip to World War II. A little background information about World War II for anyone who might not know. The conflict officially began with Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland on September 1, 1939, with England being the first country to declare war. The United States did not enter the war until the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in Oahu, Hawaii on December 7, 1941. At this time, USS Indianapolis was now leading Task Force 3, which consisted of USS Indianapolis, USS Lamberton from Mine Division 6, USS Southern and USS Long from Mine Division 5, USS Dorsey, and USS Elliott. On the same day of the Pearl Harbor attack, Task Force 3 was conducting a mock bombardment, so essentially a practice run for continuous strong attack of gunfire bombing at Johnston Atoll. The Johnston Atoll is an unincorporated territory of the United States, meaning it is not an official state, and it is located in the North Pacific Ocean between the Hawaiian Islands and the Marshall Islands. While they were there, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Immediately, the United States was searching for the aircraft carriers that launched the attack on Pearl Harbor, and USS Indianapolis would be absorbed into Task Force 12 to search for these Japanese aircraft carriers. However, they were unable to find these aircraft carriers, and USS Indianapolis returned to Pearl Harbor on December 13, 1941, and there she joined Task Force 11. If you'd like a video where we cover Pearl Harbor in depth, let me know in the comments. I've personally been there in the past, and it was a humbling experience to say the least. As part of Task Force 11, her next mission was the New Guinea Campaign. The task force sailed to the South Pacific Ocean early in 1942, stopping roughly 350 miles south of Rabaul, New Britain. The task force was escorting an aircraft carrier, the USS Lexington. During the late afternoon on February 20, 1942, 18 Japanese aircraft swooped in and attacked the fleet. Of the 18 aircraft that attacked Task Force 11, 16 were shot down by aircraft from USS Lexington, and the remaining two were shot down by anti-aircraft guns from the surrounding ships. Later that year, on March 10, 1942, USS Indianapolis and Task Force 11 joined forces with another task force centered around the carrier USS Yorktown. Together, these two task forces converged and attacked Ley and Salamoa, New Guinea. There, the Japanese forces were gathering amphibious forces, which are ships used to protect ground and air forces. The task forces were successful in inflicting heavy damage to the Japanese warships and transports, and after this, USS Indianapolis returned to the Mare Island Naval Shipyard for a refit. Her next mission was to head to Australia. She'd escort a convoy down to Australia, and after this, it was off to Alaska. 
We don't think about it often since Alaska isn't super close to Japan, but there was a major battle at the Aleutian Islands off Alaska. USS Indianapolis would play a part in this, heading for the North Pacific after leaving New Guinea to support American troops in the Battle of the Aleutian Islands. On August 7, 1942, USS Indianapolis and Task Force 11 engaged Kiska Island, which was home to a Japanese staging area. Fog did hinder observation during this fight, though USS Indianapolis and the other ships in her task force still fired their main guns into the bay. Float planes launched from cruisers, including Miss Indy herself, reported that there were Japanese ships already sunk in the harbor and devastating damage had been done to Japanese shore installations. Fifteen minutes later, the Japanese shore batteries fired back, though they were swiftly snuffed out by the task force ship's main guns. That didn't stop Japanese submarines from trying to sneak their way in to attack the task force, but these efforts were thwarted by American destroyers dropping depth charges. Japanese seaplanes tried to bomb the task force, but it was ineffective. The operation was considered a success, even though they'd gone in with a total lack of information on the Japanese forces, and later, U.S. forces would occupy nearby Adak Island, making a naval base there farther from Dutch Harbor on Unalaska Island. The following year, in January of 1943, USS Indianapolis supported a landing and occupation on Amchika, a volcanic and tectonically unstable and uninhabited island in the Rat Islands group of the Aleutian Islands in southwest Alaska. They did this as part of an island hopping strategy. The following month in February, on the evening of the 19th, USS Indianapolis and two destroyers patrolled southwest of Atu Island, scouring the ocean for Japanese warships trying to provide reinforcements to Kiska and Atu. There, Indy intercepted an enormous Japanese cargo ship, the 3,100-long-ton Ak Akagane Maru that was transporting supplies, munitions, and troops. There was a radio challenge by Indy, and the cargo vessel attempted to answer but was shelled. Akegane Maru exploded and sank with no survivors. USS Indianapolis would stay near the Aleutian Islands into the middle of 1943. In May, the Allies finally captured Atu, turning their sights to Kiska, which was thought to be the last of the Japanese holdouts in Alaska. The Allies landed on August 15th. However, they found that the Japanese had already fled the Aleutian Islands under the noses of the Allies. She was refitted again at Mare Island before heading to Hawaii to be the flagship of Vice Admiral Raymond A. Sprantz, who was commanding the 5th Fleet. After this, on November 10, 1943, she sortied from Pearl Harbor, and if you're unfamiliar with sortying, it is an attack made by troops coming out from a position of defense. She did so with the main body of the Southern Attack Force to move on to Operation Galvanic, which was the invasion of the Gilbert Islands. Nine days later, on November 19, 1943, USS Indianapolis bombarded the Tarawa Atoll, and the following day she moved on to bombard the Macon Atoll at the Battle of Macon. This military engagement lasted from November 20th to the 24th of 1943. After this engagement, she returned to the Tarawa Atoll to act as fire support for the troops landing on the shore. She shelled enemy strongpoints where landing parties were going to fight Japanese troops, as well as using the ship's anti-aircraft guns to shoot down enemy plane. All of this taking place during the Battle of Tarawa, which lasted from November 20th to the 23rd, running at the same time as the Battle of Macon. She'd stay here until the 23rd when the island was finally secured by the Allies, and after this, Indianapolis would once again be crowned the flagship of the 5th Fleet. USS Indianapolis and some of the other ships she met during the Battle of Tarawa bombarded the islands of the Kwajalein Atoll on January 31, 1944. The shelling continued into the following day, with Indianapolis successfully suppressing two of the enemy's onshore batteries. The following day after this, she destroyed a blockhouse and other Japanese shore installations, providing fire support to the advancing troops with what is called a creeping barrage. A barrage is mass-sustained artillery fire or shelling aimed at a series of points along a line, so this creeping barrage continuously pushed forward, pushing the troops forward. On February 4th, USS Indianapolis entered Kwajalein Lagoon and remained there until the Battle of Kwajalein was over. During March and February of 1944, she and the rest of the 5th Fleet attacked the Western Carolines. From March 30th to the 31st at the Palau Islands, carrier planes sank three destroyers, five oilers, 17 freighters, and damaged 17 other Japanese ships. After this, the Allies bombed airfields and mined all of the surrounding water. 
The Allies moved into strike Ulithi and Yap on March 31st, moving on to Wolai on April 1st, 1944. With Japanese planes attempting to counterattack, but being thwarted without damaging any American ships. Indianapolis shot down her second plane ever, which was a torpedo bomber, and in total, the Japanese lost 160 planes during this time, including 46 that had yet to take off. These attacks were key in keeping the Japanese forces stationed there in the Carolines from attacking American troops landing in New Guinea. In June of 1944, USS Indianapolis was moving through the Pacific Ocean with the 5th Fleet as they were busy with the assault on the Mariana Islands, an archipelago near the Mariana Trench. Carrier-based airplanes started air raids on Saipan on June 11th, followed by surface bombardment starting on June 13th. This surface bombardment included USS Indianapolis. On June 15th, Admiral Spronce got word that carriers, destroyers, cruisers, and battleships were heading south to relieve the exhausted, threatened garrisons in the Mariana Islands. But because the amphibious troops at Saipan needed protection, they could not withdraw far from the scene. As a result, a fast carrier force swooped in to assist in Saipan, and another was sent to attack Japanese air bases on Iwo Jima and Chichijima. If you've seen our episodes on Yamato and Musashi, you might remember the Battle of the Philippine Sea. A combined U.S. fleet met with the Japanese in battle here on June 19th, and it would turn out deadly, especially for the Japanese forces. Planes launched from Japanese aircraft carriers were planning to attack the Americans and then refuel and rearm at the airfields of Guam and Tinian, but they were surprised to be met by carrier planes from U.S. aircraft carriers and the anti-aircraft guns from Allied escorting ships. It was reported that that day, the U.S. Navy only lost 29 planes while destroying 426 of the Japanese planes. During this time, Indianapolis took down her third plane, a torpedo plane. This aerial engagement has been nicknamed the Marianas Turkey Shoot, particularly by Americans. Without their advantage in the air, the Japanese were sitting ducks while U.S. planes descended upon their ships, sinking the aircraft carrier Hiyo, one tanker, and two destroyers while damaging others, including Yamato. Two other carriers were sunk by U.S. submarines, the Taiho and the Shokaku. I don't speak Japanese, so I apologize if I totally butchered that. I'm very American and have a hard time speaking other languages other than Americanized English. On June 23, 1944, USS Indianapolis returned to Saipan to continue supporting troops there, moving on to Tinian six days later to destroy shore installations there in the Battle of Tinian. While this was happening, the U.S. took Guam and USS Indianapolis was the first ship to enter Opera Harbor, also called Port Opera, in Guam since early on in World War II. The ship remained there for the next few weeks before moving once again to the Western Carolines. There, the U.S. was planning more landings. Before, during, and after the Battle of Peleliu from September 12th to the 29th, she shelled the shores to protect troops landing on the beaches. After this, she steamed down to Manus Island in the Admiralty Islands, operating there for 10 days before finally she'd be refitted once more at the Mare Island Naval Shipyard in California. We move on into 1945, the year World War II was going to end. So far, the Allies have found their footing and are now winning. During this time, from the end of 1944 to the beginning of 1945, Indianapolis was overhauled. After this, she joined Vice Admiral Mark A. Mitscher's Fast Carrier Task Force on Valentine's Day, February 14, 1945. Two days after this, Indianapolis and her new task force launched an attack on Tokyo, Japan, to cover the landings happening nearby on Iwo Jima on February 19th. The United States carriers had not attacked the Japanese mainland since the Doolittle Raid in 1942, and the mission was to annihilate Japanese installations and air facilities in the home islands. Their fleet effectively surprised the Japanese coast, using bad weather to cover their approach, and for two days, they were engaged in attacks. During this time, the U.S. shot down 499 enemy planes while only losing 49 of their own, an incredible 10 to 1 kill-loss ratio. Again, I'd like to remember everyone who died during this battle was a human being, and so it is still sad and not something to jump up and down about. War is ugly, though sometimes necessary. The task force wasn't only deadly in the air, they also sank ships on the coast. They sank a cargo ship, a destroyer, and two destroyer escorts. Hangars, aircraft installations, shops, factories, and other major industrial targets crumbled as the United States pummeled them. 
As soon as they finished in Tokyo, there was no time to waste, and quickly Indianapolis and her task force zipped over to Iwo Jima to support the landings there. USS Indianapolis would stay here until March 1st, protecting invasion ships and shelling land targets. After this, she returned to Mitscher's task force just in time to hit Tokyo for a second time on March 9th, and the following day, they attacked Hachijo. The weather was horrible, but the Americans still took down 158 planes and sank five small ships, all while destroying trains and ground installations. After this, the United States was in Okinawa. While this was going on, the Fast Carrier Task Force along with USS Indianapolis were ordered to attack and destroy Japanese airfields in southern mainland Japan to make it impossible for them to launch effective airborne defense against the American landings in Okinawa. The Fast Carrier Task Force left Ulithi on March 14th to head back to Japan, arriving there and attacking on March 18th from about 100 miles off the coast of Kyushu, an island in Japan. They attacked the airfields there and the ships in the harbors of Kobe and Kure, but the Japanese were incredibly smart. They knew where the task force was, and on March 21st, they launched 48 planes to attack the ships. However, 24 planes from the task force intercepted the Japanese and shot down their planes. For the invasion of Okinawa, Indianapolis was a part of Task Force 54, and they began pre-invasion shelling of Okinawa on March 24th. During this time, Indianapolis rained down 8-inch shells on the beach for seven days straight, with aircraft viciously attacking American ships during this time. Indianapolis shot down six planes and damaged two others, bringing her total up to nine planes shot down and two damaged. On March 31st, USS Indianapolis lookouts spotted a Japanese fighter plane, a Nakajima Ki-43 Oscar, as it flew through the morning mist and dove vertically toward the bridge. This plane was going to drop a bomb on Indianapolis. The crew scrambled, with the ship's 20mm guns opening fire on the plane, but it was too late. In 15 seconds, the plane was over the bridge. Tracers converged on the fighter and the plane swerved. However, it didn't stop the bomb that was dropped onto the ship at a height of 25 feet. The plane then crashed into the sea near the port stern, and the bomb that had been dropped crashed down through the deck, through the crew's mess hall, through the berthing compartment, careening through the fuel tanks, and crashing into the keel before it exploded in the water beneath the vessel. It left two massive holes in the keel, and it flooded two nearby compartments, killing nine men. The ship's bulkheads prevented the flooding from worsening, and Indianapolis settled slightly in the stern and listed to port, but managed to make it to a salvage ship for emergency repairs. While she was here, an inspection was done that revealed her propeller shafts were damaged as well as her water distilling equipment being completely ruined, and her fuel tanks burst. After this, Indianapolis sailed back to Mare Island Naval Shipyard for repairs. It was after this that she was quite literally part of a top secret mission. Well, at least at the time it was top secret. We all know about the mission now. Major repairs and a huge overhaul was done on Indianapolis while she was at Mare Island. That's when she'd received orders to proceed to Tinian Island, carrying about half the world's supply of uranium-235 at the time, as well as other parts needed to make the atomic bomb known as Little Boy, the very bomb dropped on Hiroshima a few weeks later. USS Indianapolis, with her new orders, left Hunter's Point Naval Shipyard in San Francisco on July 16, 1945, just a few hours before the Trinity Test. The Trinity Test was the first detonation of a nuclear weapon, and it was done by the U.S. as part of the Manhattan Project at 5.29 a.m. on July 16, 1945, in the Jornada del Muerto Desert, 35 miles southeast of Socorro, New Mexico. While this was going on, USS Indianapolis raced at 29 knots down to Pearl Harbor, setting a speed record of 74 and a half hours. She made it to Pearl Harbor on July 19, 1945, and she went on alone to Tinian. This was completed on July 26, 1945. After this, she was sent to Guam. There, a number of her crew had completed their tours of duty and were relieved, being replaced by different sailors. On July 28, 1945, she left Guam to sail toward Leyte, and there, her and her crew were to receive training to continue to Okinawa. There, they joined Vice Admiral Jesse B. Oldendorf's Task Force 95. However, she'd never make it. This ship, which had gone through countless battles and delivered parts for a nuclear bomb, would be torpedoed by two Type 95 torpedoes launched from the Japanese submarine I-58 at 12.15 a.m. on July 30, 1945. 
one torpedo hit her bow and one amidships. The commander of I-58, Commander Mochitsura Hashimoto, initially believed he'd spotted the New Mexico-class battleship USS Idaho. If you want us to cover USS Idaho, let us know. She's got an interesting history. As for USS Indianapolis, the massive explosions from the torpedoes caused major damage, and immediately she listed heavily and settled in her bow. The listing was a huge problem, since she had lots of guns and added more as the war went on, and this made her incredibly top-heavy and in danger of capsizing. Twelve minutes later after she was hit, she rolled over, with her stern rising into the air, and then she disappeared under the waves soon after this. About 300 of the 1,195 crew aboard went down with Indianapolis, with very few lifeboats making it off the ship, and few of the crew had life jackets on. The rest of the crew was left bobbing in the Pacific. The big problem? The Navy had no idea USS Indianapolis had sank until they spotted survivors floating around in the ocean three and a half days afterward. At 10.25 a.m. on August 2, 1945, Lieutenant Wilbur Chuck Gwynn and his co-pilot, Lieutenant Warren Colwell, were flying their PV-1 Ventura alongside Bill Kitchen, who was flying a PBY-2 Catalina. The two planes were over the Pacific, running a routine patrol flight, when suddenly, they came upon soldiers drifting in the water. Immediately, Gwyn dropped a life raft and radio transmitter down to the stranded men, and all surface and air units capable of rescuing the men were dispatched. The first to the scene of the rescue was Lieutenant Commander Robert Adrian Marks in his PBY 5A Catalina patrol plane. Marks and his crew dropped life rafts, with one being destroyed during the drop and the others being too far from the exhausted men to be of any use. There were standing orders not to land in the open ocean, but Marks and his crew took a vote. They voted to land and help the men. They landed in 12-foot swells, maneuvering over to the men to pick up the 56 survivors. There wasn't enough room inside the plane to pick up everyone, but Marx was determined to leave no man behind, so some of the men were strapped to the wings of the airplane with parachute cord. Because of this, the plane was not able to fly, and after night came, a destroyer escort came onto the scene, USS Cecile J. Doyle. This was the first of seven ships on their way, and using their searchlight as a beacon, they eventually found the men in the water. The six other ships, along with Cecile J. Doyle, picked up all of the remaining survivors, including Marks and his men. However, his plane could not be recovered, and so it was sunk by USS Cecile J. Doyle. The survivors were haggard. Many were injured, and most suffered from dehydration and hypernatremia. Some had managed to find spam and crackers floating around in the water, but most had not. They were sunburnt by day and had hypothermia to deal with at night, and because they were floating around in salt water and the ship's bunker oil that had spilled out into the sea, they suffered greatly from desquamation, which is when the skin is shed. Some were attacked by hungry sharks, but don't worry, we'll cover this more in depth in just a bit, and others had killed themselves to avoid facing such a terrible fate. Because of the trauma and the days of suffering, some of the men suffered from delirium and hallucinations. Of the 900 men that had drifted in the ocean, only 316 had survived the sinking. Two of the survivors, Frederick Harrison and Robert Lee Shipman, unfortunately died shortly thereafter in August of 1945 due to complications from their harrowing survival story. Let's cover the shark attacks. It's not often that in the factual, real world we hear about man-eating sharks. Typically, that's a movie trope, and sharks are generally more curious than deadly. The global average for shark attacks per year as of 2023 is only 72 people annually, and only about 5 of these 72 are killed. More people are attacked by cows each year, in fact. However, hundreds of oceanic white-tipped sharks and possibly tiger sharks were drawn to the shipwreck by the scent of blood in the ocean and the sounds of all the explosions coming from the ship. They picked off the dead and wounded first, then swarming on survivors, feeding off the fear and furious kicking from the survivors. We don't know exactly how many of the men in the water were killed specifically by sharks. The estimates vary wildly, from a few dozen up to 150 men. It is classified as the deadliest shark attack in history. We do have to note that most of the men who died in the sinking either went down with the ship or passed from salt poisoning, exposure to the elements, or dehydration and thirst. One of the saddest things about the sinking is the fact that Captain Charles B. McVeigh III was reprimanded for the sinking, even though the Japanese were the ones who sunk the ship. 
He'd captained Indianapolis since November of 1944, survived many battles with her, and survived the sinking despite being one of the last to abandon ship. He was court-martialed in November of 1945 for two reasons. Failure to order his men to abandon ship and hazarding the ship. He was cleared of the first charge, but was charged for hazarding his ship by failing to zigzag. We know that zigzagging doesn't always save you from getting torpedoed, and it's been investigated later and found that this would not have helped Indianapolis. His sentence was remitted, and he was restored to active duty. However, he never escaped ridicule by some of the families of those who perished in Indianapolis. For example, one piece of mail he received said, quote, Merry Christmas! Our family's holiday would be a lot merrier if you hadn't killed my son. That is horrible to say to someone. It was the Japanese, not McVeigh. He lived with this guilt until it became too much to carry, and he killed himself in 1968 with his Navy-issued revolver. His gardener found him on his back patio, at only 70 years old. His record was cleared posthumously, and that story is interesting. We'll have to cover it in another episode, but let me know if that's something you'd like to hear about. As for Indianapolis, she was found by Paul Allen and his team on August 19, 2017, at a depth of 18,000 feet down. It's well preserved due to the depth at which she rests, and she sits within the Rocky Mountain Ranges of the North Philippine Sea. Her legacy lives on, and we shall never forget the brave men who served aboard her, those who died during the tragic sinking, and the survivors who had to live with survivor's guilt and trauma for the rest of their lives. Rest in peace to all who served aboard her, and we thank them for their service. Thanks so much to our lovely patrons for subscribing and supporting the channel and myself as a creator. You guys are awesome, and it really does help us out. If you'd like to help support this channel and future episodes, go to patreon.com slash shipwrecksunday to join. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a 5-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us, and we are also on Facebook and Instagram. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the Hilma Hooker, a Dutch vessel that sank in Bonaire in the 1980s and is now a popular dive site. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.